Chapter Six of Persuasion by Jane Austen, as read for LibriVox by Madame Tusk. This recording is in the public domain. Chapter Six. Anne had not wanted this visit to Uppercross to learn that her removal from one set of people to another, though at a distance of only three miles, will often include a total change of conversation, opinion, and idea. She had never been staying there before without being struck by it or without wishing that other Elliots could have her advantage in seeing how unknown or unconsidered there were the affairs which at Kellynch Hall were treated as of such general publicity and pervading interest. Yet, with all this experience, she believed she must now submit to feel that another lesson, in the art of knowing our own nothingness beyond our own circle, was become necessary for her. For, certainly, coming as she did, with a heart full of the subject which had been completely occupying both houses in Kellynch for many weeks, she had expected rather more curiosity and sympathy than she found in the separate but very similar remark of Mr. and Mrs. Musgrove. "'So, Miss Anne, Sir Walter and his sister are gone, and what part of Bath do you think they'll settle in?' And this, without much waiting for an answer, or in the young lady's edition of, I hope we shall be in Bath in the winter, but remember, papa, if we do go, we must be in a good situation, none of your queen squares for us. Or in the anxious supplement from Mary of, upon my word, I shall be pretty well off, when you are all gone away to be happy at Bath. She could only resolve to avoid such self-delusion in the future, and think with heightened gratitude of the extraordinary blessing of having one such truly sympathizing friend as Lady Russell. The Mr. Musgroves had their own game to guard, and to destroy, their own horses, dogs, and newspapers to engage them, and the females were fully occupied in all other common subjects of housekeeping, neighbors, dress, dancing, and music. She acknowledged it to be very fitting that every little social commonwealth should dictate its own matters of discourse, and hoped, ere long, to become a not unworthy member of the one she was now transplanted into. With the prospect of spending at least two months at Uppercross, it was highly incumbent on her to clothe her imagination, her memory, and all her ideas in as much of Uppercross as possible. She had no real dread of these two months. Mary was not so repulsive and unsisterly as Elizabeth, nor so inaccessible to all influence of hers. Neither was there anything among the other component parts of the cottage inimical to comfort. She was always on friendly terms with her brother-in-law, and in the children, who loved her dearly as well, and respected her a great deal more than their mother, she had an object of interest, amusement, and wholesome exertion. Charles Musgrove was civil and agreeable. In sense and temper he was undoubtedly superior to his wife, but not of powers or conversation or grace to make the past, as they were connected together, at all a dangerous contemplation. Though, at the same time, Anne could believe with Lady Russell that a more equal match might have greatly improved him, and that a woman of real understanding might have given more consequence to his character, and more usefulness, rationality, and elegance to his habits and pursuits. As it was, he did nothing with much zeal but sport, and his time was otherwise travelled away, without benefit from books or anything else. He had very good spirits, which never seemed much affected by his wife's occasional lowness, bore with her unreasonableness, sometimes to Anne's admiration, and upon the whole, though there was very often little disagreement, in which she had sometimes more share than she wished, being appealed to by both parties, they might pass for a happy couple. They were always perfectly agreed on the want of more money, and a strong inclination for a handsome present from his father, but here, as on most topics, he had the superiority, for while Mary thought it a great shame that such a present was not made, he always contented for his father having many other uses for his money, and a right to spend it as he liked. As to the management of their children, his theory was much better than his wife's, and his practice not so bad. I could manage them very well were it not for Mary's interference, was what Anne often heard him say, and had a good deal of faith in, but when listening in turn to Mary's reproach of, Charles spoils the children so that I cannot get them into any order. She never had the smallest temptation to say, Very true. One of the least agreeable circumstances of her residence there was her being treated with too much confidence by all parties, and being too much in the secret of the complaints of each house. Known to have some influence with her sister, she was continually requested, or at least receiving hints to exert it beyond what was practical. I wish you could persuade Mary not to be always fancying herself ill was Charles's language, and, in an unhappy mood, thus spoke Mary. 
I do believe if Charles were to see me dying, he would not think there was anything the matter with me. I am sure, Anne, if you would, you might persuade him that I really am very ill, a great deal worse than ever I am. Mary's declaration was, I hate sending the children to the great house, though their grandmamma is always wanting to see them, for she humours and indulges them to such a degree and gives them so much trash and sweet things that they are sure to come back sick and cross for the rest of the day. And Mrs. Musgrove took the first opportunity of being alone with Anne to say, "'Oh, Miss Anne, I cannot help wishing Mrs. Charles had a little of your method for those children. They are quite different creatures with you. To be sure, in general, they are so spoiled. It is a pity you can't put your sister in a way of managing them. They are as fine, healthy children as ever were seen, poor little dears, without partiality. But Mrs. Charles knows no more how they should be treated. Bless me, how troublesome they are sometimes, I assure you, Miss Anne. It prevents my wishing to see them at our house so often, as I otherwise should.' I believe Mrs. Charles is not quite pleased at my not inviting them oftener, but you know it is very bad to have children with one that one is obligated to be checking every moment, don't do this and don't do that, or that one can only keep in tolerable order by more cake than is good for them. She had this communication, moreover, from Mary. Mrs. Musgrove thinks all her servants so steady that it would be high treason to call into question, but I am sure and exaggeration that her upper housemaid and laundry maid, instead of being in their business, are gadding about the village all day long. I meet them wherever I go, and I declare I never go twice into my nursery without seeing something of them. If Jemima were not the trustiest, steadiest creature in the world, it would be enough to spoil her, for she tells me they are always tempting her to take a walk with them. And on Mrs. Musgrove's side it was, I make a rule of never interfering in any of my daughter-in-law's concerns, for I know it would not do. But I shall tell you, Miss Anne, because you may be able to set things to rights, that I have no very good opinion of Mrs. Charles' nursery-maid. I hear strange stories of her. She is always upon the cat, and from my own knowledge I can declare she is such a fine dressing lady that she is enough to ruin any servants she comes near. Mrs. Charles quite swears by her, I know, but I just give you this hint that you may be upon the watch, because if you see anything amiss, you need not be afraid of mentioning it. Again it was Mary's complaint that Mrs. Musgrove was very apt not to give her the precedent that was her due when they dined at the great house with other families, and she did not see any reason why she was to be considered so much at home as to lose her place, and one day, when Anne was walking with only the Musgroves, one of them, after talking of rank, people of rank, and jealousy of rank, said, "'I have no scruple in observing to you how nonsensical some persons are about their place, because all the world knows how easy and indifferent you are about it.' But I wish anybody could give Mary a hint that it would be a great deal better if she were not so very tenacious, especially if she would not be always putting herself forward to take place of Mamma. Nobody doubts her right to have precedence of Mamma, but it would be more becoming in her not to be always insisting on it. It is not that Mamma cares about it the least in the world, but I know it is taken notice of by many persons. How was Anne to set all these matters to rights? She could do little more than listen patiently, soften every grievance, and excuse each to the other, give them all hints of the forbearance necessary between such near neighbours, and make those hints broadest which were meant for her sister's benefit. In all other respects her visit began and proceeded very well. Her own spirits improved by change of place and subject, by being removed three miles from Kellynch, Mary's ailments lessened by having a constant companion, and their daily intercourse with the other family, since there was neither superior affection, confidence, nor employment in the cottage to be interrupted by it, was rather an advantage. It was certainly carried nearly as far as possible, for they met every morning, and hardly ever spent an evening asunder. But she believed they should not have done so well without the sight of Mr. and Mrs. Musgrove's respectable forms in the usual places, or without the talking, laughing, and singing of their daughters. She played a great deal better than either of the Miss Musgroves, but, having no voice, no knowledge of the harp, and no fond parents to sit by and fancy themselves delighted, her performance was little thought of, only out of civility, or to refresh the others, as she was well aware. She knew that when she played she was giving pleasure only to herself, but this was no new sensation. Excepting one short period of her life, she had never, since the age of fourteen, never since the loss of her dear mother, known the happiness of being listened to or encouraged by any just appreciation or real taste. In music she had been always used to feel alone in the world, 
and Mr. and Mrs. Musgrove's fond partiality for their own daughter's performance, and total indifference to any other person's, gave her much more pleasure for their sakes than mortification for her own. The party at the great house was sometimes increased by other company. The neighbourhood was not large, but the Musgroves were visited by everybody, and had more dinner-parties and more callers, more visitors by invitation and by chance, than any other family. They were more completely popular. The girls were wild for dancing, and the evenings ended, occasionally, in an unpremeditated little ball. There was a family of cousins within a walk of Uppercross, in less affluent circumstances, who depended on the Musgroves for all their pleasures. They would come at any time, and help play at anything, or dance anywhere, and Anne, very much preferring the office of musician to a more active post, played country dances to them by the hour together, a kindness which always recommended her musical powers to the notice of Mr. and Mrs. Musgrove more than anything else, and often drew this compliment. "'Well done, Miss Anne, very well done indeed. Lord bless me, how those little fingers of yours do fly about!' So passed the first three weeks. Michaelmas came— and now Anne's heart must be in Kellynch again, a beloved home made over to others, all the precious rooms and furniture, groves and prospects, beginning to own other eyes and other limbs. She could not think of much else on the twenty-ninth of September, and she had this sympathetic touch in the evening from Mary, who, on having occasion to note the day of the month, exclaimed, "'Dear me, is it not the day the Crofts were to come to Kellynch? I am glad I did not think of it before. How low it makes me!' The Crofts took possession with true naval alertness, and were to be visited. Mary deplored the necessity for herself. Nobody knew how much she should suffer. She should put it off as long as she could. But was not easy till she had talked Charles into driving her over on an early day, and was in a very animated, comfortable state of imaginary agitation when she came back. Anne had very sincerely rejoiced in there being no means of her going. She wished, however, to see the Crofts, and was glad to be within when the visit was returned. They came, the master of the house was not at home, but the two sisters were together, and as it chanced that Mrs. Croft fell to the share of Anne, while the admiral sat by Mary and made himself very agreeable by his good-humoured notice of her little boys, she was able to watch for a likeness, and if it failed her in the features, to catch it in the voice, or in the turn of sentiment and expression. Mrs. Croft, though neither tall nor fat, had a squareness, uprightness, and vigour of form which gave importance to her person. She had bright dark eyes, good teeth, and altogether an agreeable face, though her reddened and weather-beaten complexion, the consequence of her having been almost as much at sea as her husband, made her seem to have lived some years longer in the world than her real eight and thirty. Her manners were open, easy, and decided, like one who had no distrust of herself, and no doubts of what to do, without any approach to coarseness, however, or any want of good humour. Anne gave her credit, indeed, for feelings of great consideration toward herself in all that related to Kellynch, and it pleased her, especially as she had satisfied herself in the very first half-minute, in the instant even of introduction, that there was not the smallest symptom of any knowledge or suspicion on Mrs. Croft's side to give a bias of any sort. She was quite easy on that head, and consequently full of strength and courage, till, for a moment electrified by Mrs. Croft's suddenly saying— it was you, and not your sister, I find, that my brother had the pleasure of being acquainted with when he was in this country. Anne hoped she had outlived the age of blushing, but the age of emotion she certainly had not. Perhaps you may not have heard. He is married, added Mrs. Croft. She could now answer as she ought, and was happy to feel, when Mrs. Croft's next words explained it to be Mr. Wentworth, of whom she spoke, that she had said nothing which might not do for either brother— she immediately felt how reasonable it was that Mrs. Croft should be thinking and speaking of Edward, and not of Frederick, and with shame at her own forgetfulness applied herself to the knowledge of their former neighbour's present state with proper interest. The rest was all tranquillity, till just as they were moving, she heard the Admiral say to Mary, "'We are expecting a brother of Mrs. Croft's here soon. I dare say you know his name.' He was cut short by the eager attacks of the little boys, clinging to him like an old friend and declaring he should not go, and being too much engrossed by proposals of carrying them away in his coat-pockets, etc., to have another moment for finishing or recollecting what he had begun. Anne was left to persuade herself, as well as she could, that the same brother must still be in question. She could not, however, reach such a degree of certainty, as not to be anxious to hear whether anything had been said on the subject at the other house where the Crofts had previously been calling. 
The folks of the great house were to spend the evening of this day at the cottage, and it being now too late in the year for such visits to be made on foot, the coach was beginning to be listened for, when the youngest Miss Musgrove walked in. That she was coming to apologize, and that they should have to spend the evening by themselves, was the first black idea, and Mary was quite ready to be affronted, when Louisa made all right by saying that she only came on foot to leave more room for the harp, which was bringing in the carriage. "'And I will tell you our reason.' she added, and all about it. I am come on to give you notice that papa and mamma are out of spirits this evening, especially mamma. She is thinking so of poor Richard, and we agreed it would be best to have the harp, for it seems to amuse her more than the pianoforte. I will tell you why she is out of spirits. When the Crofts called this morning, they called here afterwards, did not they? They happened to say that her brother, Captain Wentworth, has just returned to England, or paid off or something, and is coming to see them almost directly. And most unluckily, it came into Mamma's head when they were gone, that Wentworth, or something very like it, was the name of poor Richard's captain at the time. I do not know when or where, but a great while before he died, poor fellow, and upon looking over his letters and things, she found it was so, and is perfectly sure that this must be the very man, and her head is quite full of it, and of poor Richard, so we must be as merry as we can, that she may not be dwelling upon such gloomy things." The real circumstances of this pathetic piece of family history were that the Musgroves had had the ill fortune of a very troublesome, hopeless son, and the good fortune to lose him before he reached his twentieth year, that he had been sent to sea because he was stupid and unmanageable on shore, that he had been very ill cared for at any time by his family, though quite as much as he deserved, seldom heard of, and scarcely at all regarded when the intelligence of his death abroad had worked its way up to Uppercross two years before. He had, in fact, though his sisters were now doing all they could for him by calling him poor Richard, been nothing better than a thick-headed, unfeeling, unprofitable Dick Musgrove, who had never done anything to entitle himself to more than the abbreviation of his name, living or dead. He had been several years at sea, and had, in the course of those removals to which all midshipmen are liable, and especially such midshipmen as every captain wishes to get rid of, been six months on board Captain Frederick Wentworth's frigate, the Laconia, and from the Laconia he had, under the influence of his captain, written the only two letters which his father and mother had ever received from him during the whole of his absence, that is to say, the only two disinterested letters, all the rest had been mere applications for money. In each letter he had spoken well of his captain, but yet so little were they in the habit of attending to such matters, so unobservant and incurious were they as to the names of men or ships, that it had made scarcely any impression at the time, and that Mrs. Musgrove should have been suddenly struck this very day with the recollection of the name of Wentworth, as connected with her son, seemed one of those extraordinary bursts of mind which do sometimes occur. She had gone to her letters, and found it all as she supposed, and the reperusal of these letters, after so long an interval, her poor son gone for ever, and all the strength of his faults forgotten, had affected her spirits exceedingly, and thrown her into greater grief for him than she had known on first hearing of his death. Mr. Musgrove was, in a lesser degree, affected likewise, and when they reached the cottage they were evidently in want, first of being listened to anew on this subject, and afterwards of all the relief which cheerful companions could give them. To hear them talking so much of Captain Wentworth, repeating his name so often, puzzling over past years, and at last ascertaining that it might, that it probably would, turn out to be the very same Captain Wentworth whom they recollected meeting once or twice after their coming back from Clifton, a very fine young man, but they could not say whether it was seven or eight years ago, was a new sort of trial to Anne's nerves. She found, however, that it was one to which she must inure herself. Since he actually was expected in the country, she must teach herself to be insensible on such points, and not only did it appear that he was expected, and speedily, but the Musgroves, in their warm gratitude for the kindness he had shown poor Dick, and a very high respect for his character, stamped as it was by poor Dick's having been six months under his care, and mentioning him in strong, though not perfectly well-spelt praise, as a fine dashing fellow, only too particular about the schoolmaster, were bent on introducing themselves, and seeking his acquaintance as soon as they could hear of his arrival. The resolution of doing so helped to form the comfort of their evening. End of chapter 6「Persuasion」by Jane Austen As read for LibriVox by Madame Tusk This recording is in the public domain. Chapter 7 A very few days more, and Captain Wentworth was known to be at Kellynch, and Mr. Musgrove had called on him, and come back warm in his praise, 
and he was engaged with the Crofts to dine at Uppercross by the end of another week. It had been a great disappointment to Mr. Musgrove to find that no earlier day could be fixed, so impatient was he to show his gratitude by seeing Captain Wentworth under his own roof, and welcoming him to all that was strongest and best in his cellars. But a week must pass, only a week, in Anne's reckoning, and then she supposed they must meet, and soon she began to wish that she could feel secure even for a week. Captain Wentworth made a very early return to Mr. Musgrove's civility, and she was all but calling there in the same half-hour. She and Mary were actually setting forward for the great house, where, as she afterwards learnt, they must inevitably have found him, when they were stopped by the eldest boys being at that moment brought home in consequence of a bad fall. The child's situation put the visit entirely aside, but she could not hear of her escape with indifference, even in the midst of the serious anxiety which they afterwards felt on his account. His collarbone was found to be dislocated, and such injury received in the back as roused the most alarming ideas. It was an afternoon of distress, and Anne had everything to do at once, the apothecary to send for, the father to have pursued and informed, the mother to support and keep from hysterics, the servants to control, the youngest child to banish, and the poor suffering one to attend and soothe, besides sending, as soon as she recollected it, proper notice to the other house, which brought her an accession rather of frightened inquiring companions than of very useful assistance. Her brother's return was the first comfort. He could take best care of his wife, and the second blessing was the arrival of the apothecary. Till he came and had examined the child, their apprehensions were the worse for being vague. They suspected great injury, but knew not where. But now the collar-bone was soon replaced, and though Mr. Robinson felt and felt and rubbed and looked grave and spoke low words both to the father and the aunt, still they were all to hope the best, and to be able to part and eat their dinner in tolerable ease of mind. And then it was, just before they parted, that the two young aunts were able so far to digress from their nephew's state as to give the information of Captain Wentworth's visit, staying five minutes behind their father and mother to endeavour to express how perfectly delighted they were with him, how much handsomer, how infinitely more agreeable they thought him than any individual among their male acquaintance who had been at all a favourite before, how glad they had been to hear papa invite him to stay to dinner, how sorry when he said it was quite out of his power, and how glad again when he had promised in reply to papa and mamma's further pressing invitations to come and dine with them on the morrow, actually on the morrow, and he had promised it in so pleasant a manner, as if he felt all the motive of their attention just as he ought, and in short he had looked and said everything with such exquisite grace that they could assure them all their heads were both turned by him, and off they ran quite as full of glee as of love, and apparently more full of Captain Wentworth than of little Charles. The same story and the same raptures were repeated when the two girls came with their father through the gloom of the evening to make inquiries, and Mr. Musgrove, no longer under the first uneasiness about his heir, could add his confirmation and praise, and hope there would be now no occasion for putting Captain Wentworth off, and only be sorry to think that the cottage party probably would not like to leave the little boy to give him the meeting. Oh, no, as to leaving the little boy! Both father and mother were in much too strong and recent alarm to bear the thought, and Anne, with the joy of the escape, could not help adding her warm protestations to theirs. Charles Musgrove, indeed, afterwards showed more of inclination. The child was going on so well, and he wished so much to be introduced to Captain Wentworth, that, perhaps, he might join them in the evening. He would not dine from home, but he might walk in for half an hour. But in this he was eagerly opposed by his wife, with— "'Oh, no, indeed, Charles, I cannot bear to have you go away. Only think if anything should happen.' The child had a good night, and was going on well the next day. It must be work of time to ascertain that no injury had been done to the spine, but Mr. Robinson found nothing to increase alarm, and Charles Musgrove began, consequently, to feel no necessity for longer confinement. The child was to be kept in bed and amused as quietly as possible. But what was there for a father to do? This was quite a female case, and it would be highly absurd in him, who could be of no use at home, to shut himself up. His father very much wished him to meet Captain Wentworth, and there being no sufficient reason against it, he ought to go, and it ended in his making a bold public declaration, when he came in from shooting, of his meaning to dress directly and dine at the other house. "'Nothing can be going on better than the child,' said he, "'so I told my father just now that I would come, and he thought me quite right. Your sister being with you, my love, I have no scruple at all. You would not like to leave him yourself, but you see I can be of no use. Anne will send for me if anything is the matter.' Husbands and wives generally understand when opposition will be vain. 
Mary knew, from Charles's manner of speaking, that he was quite determined on going, and that it would be of no use to tease him. She said nothing, therefore, till he was out of the room, but as soon as there was only Anne to hear. "'So, you and I are to be left to shift by ourselves with this poor sick child, and not a creature coming near us all the evening. I knew how it would be. This is always my luck. If there's anything disagreeable going on, men are always sure to get out of it, and Charles is as bad as any of them. Very unfeeling. I must say it is very unfeeling of him to be running away from his poor little boy. He talks of his being going on so well. How does he know that he is going on so well, or that there may not be a sudden change half an hour hence? I do not think Charles would have been so unfeeling.' So here he is to go away and enjoy himself, and because I am the poor mother, I am not to be allowed to stir, and yet I am sure I am more unfit than anybody else to be about the child. My being the mother is the very reason why my feelings should not be tried. I am not at all equal to it. You saw how hysterical I was yesterday. But that was only the effect of the suddenness of your alarm, of the shock. You will not be hysterical again. I dare say we shall have nothing to distress us. I perfectly understand Mr. Robin's directions, and have no fears. And indeed, Mary, I cannot wonder at your husband. Nursing does not belong to a man. It is not his province. A sick child is always the mother's property. Her own feelings generally make it so. I hope I am as fond of my child as any mother, but I do not know that I am of any more use in the sick room than Charles, for I cannot always be scolding and teasing the poor child when it is ill. And you saw this morning that if I told him to keep quiet, he was sure to begin kicking about. I have not nerves for the sort of thing." "'But could you be comfortable yourself to be spending the whole evening away from the poor boy?' "'Yes, you see, his papa can, and why should not I? Jemima is so careful, and she could send us word every hour how he was. I really think Charles might as well have told his father we would all come. I am not more alarmed about little Charles now than he is. I was dreadfully alarmed yesterday, but the case is very different to-day.' "'Well, if you do not think it too late to give notice for yourself, suppose you were to go, as well as your husband.' Leave little Charles to my care. Mr. and Mrs. Musgrove cannot think it wrong while I remain with him. Are you serious? cried Mary, her eyes brightening. Dear me, that's a very good thought. Very good indeed. To be sure, I may just as well go as not, for I am of no use at home, am I? And it only harasses me. You, who have not a mother's feelings, are a great deal the properest person. You can make little Charles do anything. He always minds you at a word. It will be a great deal better than leaving him only with Jemima. Oh, I shall certainly go. I am sure I ought, if I can, quite as much as Charles, for they want me excessively to be acquainted with Captain Wentworth, and I know you do not mind being left alone. An excellent thought of yours indeed, Anne. I will go and tell Charles and get ready directly. You can send for us, you know, at a moment's notice, if anything is the matter. But I dare say there will be nothing to alarm you. I should not go, you may be sure, if I did not feel quite at ease about my dear child. The next moment she was tapping at her husband's dressing-room door, and, as Anne followed her upstairs, she was in time for the whole conversation, which began with Mary saying, in a tone of great exultation, "'I mean to go with you, Charles, for I am of no more use at home than you are. If I were to shut myself up for ever with the child, I should not be able to persuade him to do anything he did not like. Anne will stay. Anne undertakes to stay at home and take care of him. It is Anne's own proposal, and so I shall go with you, which will be a great deal better, for I have not dined at the other house since Tuesday.' "'This is very kind of Anne,' was her husband's answer, "'and I should be very glad to have you go.' but it seems rather hard that she should be left at home by herself to nurse our sick child. Anne was now at hand to take up her own cause, and the sincerity of her manner being soon sufficient to convince him, where conviction was at least very agreeable, he had no farther scruples as to her being left to dine alone, though he still wanted her to join them in the evening, when the child might be at rest for the night, and kindly urged her to let him come and fetch her, but she was quite unpersuadable, and this being the case, she had, ere long, the pleasure of seeing them set off together in high spirits. They were gone, she hoped, to be happy, however oddly constructed such happiness might seem. As for herself, she was left with as many sensations of comfort as were, perhaps, ever likely to be hers. She knew herself to be of the first utility to the child, and what was it to her if Frederick Wentworth were only half a mile distant, making himself agreeable to others? She would have liked to know how he felt as to a meeting perhaps indifferent, if indifference could exist under such circumstances, he must be either indifferent or unwilling. Had he wished ever to see her again, he need not have waited till this time. He would have done what she could not but believe that, in his place, she should have done long ago, when events had been early giving him the independence which alone had been wanting. Her brother and sister came back delighted with their new acquaintance, and their visit in general, 
There had been music, singing, talking, laughing, all that was most agreeable, charming manners in Captain Wentworth, no shyness or reserve. They seemed all to know each other perfectly, and he was coming the very next morning to shoot with Charles. He was to come to breakfast, but not at the cottage, though that had been proposed at first, and then he had been pressed to come to the great house instead, and he seemed afraid of being in Mrs. Charles Musgrove's way on account of the child, and therefore, somehow, they hardly knew how, it ended in Charles being to meet him to breakfast at his father's. Anne understood it. He wished to avoid seeing her. He had inquired after her, she found, slightly, as might suit a former slight acquaintance, seeming to acknowledge such as she had acknowledged, actuated, perhaps, by the same view of escaping introduction when they were to meet. The morning hours of the cottage were always later than those of the other house, and on the morrow the difference was so great that Mary and Anne were not more than beginning breakfast, when Charles came in to say that they were just setting off, that he was come for his dogs and that his sisters were following with Captain Wentworth. His sisters, meaning to visit Mary and the child, and Captain Wentworth proposing also to wait on her for a few minutes, if not inconvenient, and though Charles had answered for the child's being in no such state as to make it inconvenient, Captain Wentworth would not be satisfied without his running on to give notice. Mary, very much gratified by this attention, was delighted to receive him, while a thousand feelings rushed on Anne, of which this was the most consoling, that it would be soon over." and it was soon over. In two minutes after Charles' preparation, the others appeared. They were in the drawing-room. Her eye half met Captain Wentworth's. A bow, a curtsey passed. She heard his voice. He talked to Mary, said all that was right, said something to the Miss Musgroves, enough to mark an easy footing. The room seemed full, full of persons and voices, but a few minutes ended it. Charles showed himself at the window. All was ready. Their visitor had bowed and was gone. The Miss Musgroves were gone, too, suddenly resolved to walk to the end of the village with a sportsman. The room was cleared, and Anne might finish her breakfast as she could. "'It is over, it is over,' she repeated to herself again and again in nervous gratitude. "'The worst is over.' Mary talked, but she could not attend. She had seen him. They had met. They had been once more in the same room. Soon, however, she began to reason with herself, and try to be feeling less— Eight years, almost eight years, had passed, since all had been given up. How absurd to be resuming the agitation which such an interval had banished into distance and indistinctness! What might not eight years do? Events of every description, changes, alienations, removals, all, all must be comprised in it, and oblivion of the past. How natural, how certain, too, and included nearly a third part of her own life! Alas, with all her reasoning, she found that to retentive feelings eight years may be little more than nothing. Now, how were his sentiments to be read? Was this like wishing to avoid her? And the next moment she was hating herself for the folly which asked the question. On another question, which perhaps her utmost wisdom might not have prevented, she was soon spared all suspense, for, after the Miss Musgroves had returned and finished their visit at the cottage, she had this spontaneous information from Mary— "'Captain Wentworth is not very gallant to you, Anne, though he was so attentive to me. Henrietta asked him what he thought of you when they went away, and he said, "'You were so altered. He should not have known you again.' Mary had no feelings to make her respect her sisters in a common way, but she was perfectly unconscious of being inflicting any peculiar wound. "'Altered beyond his knowledge,' Anne fully submitted in silent, deep mortification. Doubtless it was so, and she could take no revenge.' for he was not altered, or not for the worse. She had already acknowledged it to herself, and she could not think differently, let him think of her as he would. No, the years which had destroyed her youth and bloom had only given him a more glowing, manly, open look, in no respect lessening his personal advantages. She had seen the same Frederick Wentworth. So altered that he should not have known her again. These were words which could not but dwell with her, Yet she soon began to rejoice that she had heard them. They were of sobering tendency. They allayed agitation. They composed, and consequently must make her happier. Frederick Wentworth had used such words, or something like them, but without an idea that they would be carried round to her. He had thought her wretchedly altered, and in the first moment of appeal had spoken as he felt. He had not forgiven Anne Elliot. She had used him ill deserted and disappointed him, and worse, she had shown a feebleness of character in doing so, which his own decided, confident temper could not endure. She had given him up to oblige others. It had been the effect of over-persuasion. 
it had been weakness and timidity. He had been most warmly attached to her, and had never seen a woman since whom he thought her equal, but, except from natural sensation of curiosity, he had no desire of meeting her again. Her power with him was gone for ever. It was now his object to marry. He was rich, and, being turned on shore, fully intended to settle as soon as he could be properly tempted, actually looking round, ready to fall in love with all the speed which a clear head and a quick taste could allow. He had a heart for either of the Miss Musgroves, if they could catch it, a heart, in short, for any pleasing young woman who came in his way, excepting Anne Elliot. This was his only secret exception, when he said to his sister, in answer to her suppositions, "'Yes, here I am, Sophia, quite ready to make a foolish match. Anybody between fifteen and thirty may have me for the asking. A little beauty, a few smiles, a few compliments of the navy, and I am a lost man. Should not this be enough for a sailor who has had no society among women to make him nice?' He said it, she knew, to be contradicted. His bright, proud eye spoke the conviction that he was nice, and Anne Elliot was not out of his thoughts when he more seriously described the woman he should wish to meet with. A strong mind, with sweetness of manner, made the first and the last of description. "'This is the woman I want,' said he. "'Something a little inferior I shall, of course, put up with. But it must not be much. If I am a fool, I shall be a fool indeed, for I have thought on the subject more than most men.'" End of chapter 7《Chapter Eight of Persuasion by Jane Austen, as read for LibriVox by Madame Tusk. This recording is in the public domain.》Chapter Eight. From this time, Captain Wentworth and Anne Elliot were repeatedly in the same circle. They were soon dining in company together at Mr. Musgrove's, for the little boy's state could no longer supply his aunt with a pretence for absenting herself, and this was but the beginning of other dinings and other meetings. Whether former feelings were to be renewed must be brought to the proof. Former times must undoubtedly be brought to the recollection of each. They could not but be reverted to. The year of their engagement could not but be named by him, in the little narratives or descriptions which conversation called forth. His profession qualified him, his disposition led him, to talk, and— That was in the year six. That happened before I went to sea, in the year six, occurred in the course of the first evening they spent together— and though his voice did not falter, and though she had no reason to suppose his eye wandering towards her while he spoke, Anne felt the utter impossibility, from her knowledge of his mind, that he could be unvisited by remembrance any more than herself. There must be the same immediate association of thought, though she was very far from conceiving it to be of equal pain. They had no conversation together, no intercourse but what the commonest civility required. Once so much to each other, now nothing— there had been a time when of all the large party now filling the drawing-room at Uppercross, they would have found it most difficult to cease to speak to one another, with the exception, perhaps, of Admiral and Mrs. Croft, who seemed particularly attached and happy, and could allow no other exceptions even among the married couples. There could have been no hearts so open, no tastes so similar, no feelings so in unison, no countenances so beloved. Now they were as strangers." nay, worse than strangers, for they could never become acquainted. It was a perpetual estrangement. When he talked, she heard the same voice, and discerned the same mind. There was a very general ignorance of all naval matters throughout the party, and he was very much questioned, and especially by the two Miss Musgroves, who seemed hardly to have any eyes but for him, as to the manner of living on board, daily regulations, food, hours, etc., and their surprise at his accounts, at learning the degree of accommodation and arrangement which was practicable, drew from him some pleasant ridicule, which reminded Anne of the early days when she too had been ignorant, and she too had been accused of supposing sailors to be living on board without anything to eat, or any cook to dress it if there were, or any servant to wait, or any knife and fork to use. From thus listening and thinking, she was roused by a whisper from Mrs. Musgrove, who, overcome by fond regrets, could not help saying, "'Ah, oh, Miss Anne, if it had pleased heaven to spare my poor son, I dare say he would have been just such another by this time.' Anne suppressed a smile, and listened kindly, while Mrs. Musgrove believed her heart a little more, and for a few minutes, therefore, could not keep pace with the conversation of the others. When she could let her attention take its natural course again, she found the Miss Musgroves just fetching the navy list.' 
their own navy list, the first that had ever been at Uppercross, and sitting down together to pore over it, with the professed view of finding out the ships that Captain Wentworth had commanded. "'Your first was the Asp, I remember. We will look for the Asp.' "'You will not find her there. Quite worn out and broken up. I was the last man who commanded her, hardly fit for service then, reported fit for home service for a year or two, and so I was sent off to the West Indies.' The girls looked all amazement. "'The Admiralty,' he continued, "'entertain themselves now and then with sending a few hundred men to sea in a ship not fit to be employed. But they have a great many to provide for, and among the thousands that may just as well go to the bottom as not, it is impossible for them to distinguish the very set who may be least missed.' "'Pooh, pooh!' cried the Admiral. "'What stuff these young fellows talk! Never was a better sloop than the Asp in her day. For an old-built sloop you would not see her equal.' Lucky fellow to get her. He knows there must have been twenty better men than himself applying for her at the same time. Lucky fellow to get anything so soon, with no more interest than his. I felt my luck, Admiral, I assure you, replied Captain Wentworth seriously. I was as well satisfied with my appointment as you can desire. It was a great object with me at that time to be at sea. A very great object. I wanted to be doing something. To be sure you did. What should a young fellow like you do ashore for half a year together? If a man had not a wife, he soon wants to be afloat again. "'But, Captain Wentworth,' cried Louisa, "'how vexed you must have been when you came to the Asp to see what an old thing they had given you!' "'I had no more discoveries to make than you would have as to the fashion and strength of any old police which you had seen lent about among half your acquaintance ever since you could remember, and which, at last, at some very wet day, is lent to yourself. Ah, she was the dear old Asp to me. She did all that I wanted. I knew she would.' I knew that we should either go to the bottom together, or that she would be the making of me, and I never had two days of foul weather all the time I was at sea in her, and after taking privateers enough to be very entertaining, I had the good luck in my passage home, the next autumn, to fall in with the very French frigate I wanted. I brought her into Plymouth, and here another instance of luck. We had not been six hours in the sound, when a gale came on which lasted four days and nights, and which would have done for poor old Asp in half the time. Our touch with the great nation not having much improved our condition. Born twenty hours later, and I should only have been a gallant Captain Wentworth in a small paragraph at one corner of the newspapers, and being lost in only a sloop, nobody would have thought about me. Anne's shudderings were to herself alone, but the Miss Musgroves could be as open as they were sincere in their exclamations of pity and horror. "'And so then, I suppose,' said Mrs. Musgrove, in a low voice, as if thinking aloud, "'so then he went away to the Laconia.' and there he met with our poor boy charles my dear beckoning him to her do ask captain wentworth where it was that he first met your poor brother i always forgot it was at gibraltar mother i know dick had been left ill at gibraltar with a recommendation from his former captain to captain wentworth oh but charles tell captain wentworth he need not be afraid of mentioning poor dick before me for it would be rather a pleasure to hear him talked of by such a good friend Charles, being somewhat more mindful of the probabilities of the case, only nodded in reply, and walked away. The girls were now hunting for the Laconia, and Captain Wentworth could not deny himself the pleasure of taking the precious volume into his own hands to save them the trouble, and once more read aloud the little statement of her name and rate, and present non-commissioned class, observing over it that she, too, had been one of the best friends men ever had. "'Ah, those were pleasant days when I had the Laconia.' How fast I made money in her! A friend of mine and I had such a lovely cruise together off the Western Islands. Poor Harville's sister, you know how much he wanted money, worse than myself. He had a wife. Excellent fellow! I shall never forget his happiness. He felt it all, so much for her sake. I wished for him again the next summer, when I had still the same luck in the Mediterranean. And I am sure, sir, said Mrs. Musgrove, it was a lucky day for us when you were put captain into that ship. We shall never forget what you did." Her feelings made her speak low, and Captain Wentworth, hearing only in part, and probably not having Dick Musgrove at all near his thoughts, looked rather in suspense, as if waiting for more. "'My brother,' whispered one of the girls, "Mamma is thinking of poor Richard.' "'Poor dear fellow,' continued Mrs. Musgrove, "'he was grown so steady and such an excellent correspondent while he was under your care. Ah, oh, it would have been a happy thing if he had never left you. I assure you, Captain Wentworth, we are very sorry he ever left you.' There was a momentary expression in Captain Wentworth's face at this speech, a certain glance of his bright eye and curl of his handsome mouth, which convinced Anne that, instead of sharing in Mrs. Musgrove's kind wishes as to her son, he had probably been at some pains to get rid of him, but it was too transient an indulgence of self-amusement to be detected by any who understood him less than herself, 
In another moment he was perfectly collected and serious, and almost instantly afterwards, coming up to the sofa, on which she and Mrs. Musgrove were sitting, took a place by the latter, and entered into a conversation with her, in a low voice, about her son, doing it with so much sympathy and natural grace, as showed the kindest consideration for all that was real and unabsurd in the parents' feelings. They were actually on the same sofa, for Mrs. Musgrove had most readily made room for him. They were divided by only Mrs. Musgrove. It was no insignificant barrier, indeed. Mrs. Musgrove was of a comfortable, substantial size, infinitely more fitted by nature to express good cheer and good humour than tenderness and sentiment. And while the agitations of Anne's slender form and pensive face may be considered as very completely screened, Captain Wentworth should be allowed some credit for the self-command with which he attended to her large, fat sighings over the destiny of a son whom, alive, nobody had cared for. Personal size and mental sorrow have certainly no necessary proportions. A large, bulky figure has as good a right to be in deep affliction as the most graceful set of limbs in the world. But fair or not fair, there are unbecoming conjunctions which reason will patronize in vain, which taste cannot tolerate, which ridicule will seize. The Admiral, after taking two or three refreshing turns about the room with his hands behind him, being called to order by his wife, now came up to Captain Wentworth and without any observation of what he might be interrupting, thinking only of his own thoughts, began with, "'If you had been a week later at Lisbon last spring, Frederick, you would have been asked to give passage to a Lady Mary Grayson and her daughters.' "'Should I? I am glad I was not a week later, then.' The Admiral abused him for his want of gallantry. He defended himself, though professing that he would never willingly admit any ladies on board a ship of his, excepting for a ball, or a visit, which a few hours might comprehend. "'But if I know myself,' said he, this is from no want of gallantry towards them. It is rather from feeling how impossible it is, with all one's efforts, and all one's sacrifices, to make the accommodations on board such as women ought to have. There can be no want of gallantry, Admiral, in rating the claims of women to every personal comfort high, and this is what I do. I hate to hear of women on board, or to see them on board, and no ship under my command shall ever convey a family of ladies anywhere, if I can help it. This brought his sister upon him. "'Oh, Frederick, I cannot believe it of you. "'All oh, idle refinement. "'Women may be as comfortable on board "'as in the best house in England. "'I believe I have lived just as much on board "'as most women, "'and I know nothing superior "'to the accommodations of a man of war. "'I declare I have not a comfort "'or indulgence about me, "'even at Kellynch Hall, "'with a kind bow to Anne, "'beyond what I always had "'in most of the ships I have lived in, "'and they have been five altogether. "'Nothing to the purpose.' replied her brother. You were living with your husband, and were the only woman on board. But you yourself brought Mrs. Harville, her sister, her cousin, and three children, round from Portsmouth to Plymouth. Where was this superfine, extraordinary sort of gallantry of yours then? All merged in my friendship, Sophia. I would assist any brother officer's wife that I could, and I would bring anything of Harville's from the world's end if he wanted it. But do not imagine that I did not feel it an evil in itself." depend on it, they were all perfectly comfortable. I might not like them the better for that, perhaps. Such a number of women and children have no right to be comfortable on board. My dear Frederick, you are talking quite idly. Pray, what would become of us poor sailors' wives, who often want to be conveyed to one port or another after our husbands, if everybody had your feelings? My feelings, you see, do not prevent my taking Mrs. Harville and all her family to Plymouth. "'But I hate to hear you talking so like a fine gentleman, "'and as if women were all fine ladies, instead of rational creatures. "'We none of us expect to be in smooth water all our days.' "'My dear,' said the Admiral, "'when he had got a wife he will sing a different tune. "'When he is married, if we have the good luck to live to another war, "'we shall see him do as you and I, and a great many others have done. "'We shall have him very thankful to anybody that will bring him his wife.' "'Aye, we shall.' "'Now I have done,' cried Captain Wentworth. "'When once married people begin to attack me with, "'Oh, you will think very differently when you are married, "'I can only say, no, I shall not. "'And then they say again, oh, yes, you will, and there's an end of it.' He got up and moved away. "'What a great traveller you must have been, ma'am,' said Mrs. Musgrove to Mrs. Croft. "'Pretty well, ma'am, in the fifteen years of my marriage, "'though many women have done more. "'I have crossed the Atlantic four times.' and have been once to the East Indies, and back again, and only once, besides being in different places about home, Cork, and Lisbon, and Gibraltar. 
"'But I never went beyond the Straits, and never was in the West Indies. "'We do not call Bermuda or Bahama, you know, the West Indies.' Mrs. Musgrove had not a word to say in dissent. She could not accuse herself of having ever called them anything in the whole course of her life. "'And I do assure you, ma'am,' pursued Mrs. Croft, "'that nothing can exceed the accommodations of a man of war. I speak, you know, of the higher rates. When you come to a frigate, of course, you are more confined, though any reasonable woman may be perfectly happy in one of them, and I can safely say that the happiest part of my life has been spent on board a ship. While we were together, you know, there was nothing to be feared.' "'Thank God, I have always been blessed with excellent health, and no climate disagrees with me. A little disordered, always the first twenty-four hours of going to sea, but never knew what sickness was afterwards. The only time I ever really suffered in body or mind, the only time that I ever fancied myself unwell, or had any ideas of danger, was the winter that I passed by myself, at Deal, when the Admiral, Captain Croft then, was in the North Seas. I lived in perpetual fright at that time, and had all manner of imaginary complaints from not knowing what to do with myself, or when I should hear from him next. But as long as we could be together, nothing ever ailed me, and I never met with the smallest inconvenience. "'I to be sure. Yes, indeed. Oh, yes, I am quite of your opinion, Mrs. Croft,' was Mrs. Musgrove's hearty answer. "'There's nothing so bad as a separation. I'm quite of your opinion. I know what it is, for Mr. Musgrove always tends the assizes, and I am so glad when they are over, and he is safe back again.' The evening ended with dancing. On its being proposed, Anne offered her services, as usual, and though her eyes would sometimes fill with tears as she sat at the instrument, she was extremely glad to be employed, and desired nothing in return but to be unobserved. It was a merry, joyous party, and no one seemed in higher spirits than Captain Wentworth. She felt that he had everything to elevate him which general attention and deference, and especially the attention of all the young women, could do. The Miss Haters, the females of the family of cousins already mentioned, were apparently admitted to the honour of being in love with him, and as for Henrietta and Louisa, they both seemed so entirely occupied by him that nothing but the continued appearance of the most perfect goodwill between themselves could have made it credible that they were not decided rivals. If he were a little spoilt by such universal, such eager admiration, who could wonder? These were some of the thoughts which occupied Anne, while her fingers were mechanically at work, proceeding for half an hour together, equally without error and without consciousness. Once she felt that he was looking at herself, observing her altered features, perhaps trying to trace in them the ruins of the face which had once charmed him, and once she knew that he must have spoken of her. She was hardly aware of it till she heard the answer, but then she was sure of his having asked his partner whether Miss Elliot never danced. The answer was, "'Oh, no, never. She has quite given up dancing. She had rather play. She is never tired of playing.' Once, too, he spoke to her. She had left the instrument, on the dancing being over, and he had sat down to try to make out an air which he wished to give the Miss Musgroves an idea of. Unintentionally she returned to that part of the room, and he saw her, and instantly rising, said with a studied politeness, "'I beg your pardon, madam. This is your seat.' and though she immediately drew back with a decided negative, he was not to be induced to sit down again. Anne did not wish for more such looks and speeches. His cold politeness, his ceremonious grace, were worse than anything. End of chapter 8